One of the things that we try to get across to our students from a content knowledge is the law of conservation. There are actually several laws of conservation. Law of conservation of mass or matter is typically the most common one that we discuss. I discovered that my students have a law of conservation of their own that I was completely unaware even existed, and they call it the law of conservation of volume. They are quite convinced that when you mix two liquids together, 50 milliliters of one or 50 milliliters of the other, it will add up to 100 milliliters no matter what. And I didn't actually recognize that until I was just doing a demonstration in my classroom and sort of realized the answer that they gave me was completely wrong. And so there are a couple of demonstrations you can use to clarify this and really get a visual picture for students to see what's going on. So one of the ones I do is that I'll take an ordinary beaker and I will ask my students, is this beaker full? To which most of them will say no. The occasional very bright student might say, yes, it's full of air. Um, but most of this at this level, if they can't see it, it's not actually there. So they will assume that there's nothing inside of that beaker. So I will start to fill the beaker. And I'll just take some ping pong balls or golf balls and start to fill up the beaker. Uh, maybe I can get one more in here. No, that's not really in there, so I'm going to leave it out. So I'll then ask them, is the beaker full? To which maybe half of them, and I have students vote, so you just say, if you think it's full, give me a thumbs up. If you think it's not full, give me a thumbs down. You can get a very quick visual picture. It's really safe because half the class will be up, half will be down. Actually, in a lot of cases, more than half the class at this point will say thumbs up, uh, but it depends on the year. And then I say, okay, well, if it's full, then what happens if I put more into it? And instead of using ping pong balls, I'll use smaller spheres and start to use marbles. And so they now start to realize that, all right, there's a little bit of it, you know, there's some space in between those ping pong balls. They're not exactly filling the beaker completely. You can get a little bit more inside. And so they start to recognize, okay, there's more to the story than it just being full. And so you can ask them at this point, is the beaker actually full? And they'll look at it and they'll say, well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Sometimes they'll have to pour some of it out to get... Sometimes you have to do finagling to get the marbles down in there. And they'll say, okay, well, maybe now the beaker is actually full. And I'll actually po do the same thing. Ask my students, thumbs up, thumbs down. Beaker full, beaker empty. Or not completely full, I guess I should say. And uh, at this point, most of the thumbs are down because they can actually see that there's more spaces in between, but there might be a few students that think that the beaker is now full. So then we go to the next size particle. And you can just get ordinary shot uh, BBs from any sort of gaming store or anything like that. And then I ask them at this point, is the beaker full? And we can start to fill in a lot of those gaps in between the molecules. by using some of the BBs. Now you can use copper shot, anything that's small and regularly cylindrical or regularly spherical will work fine. So after we get to this point, my students can start to see that there's more spaces in between there that haven't been filled. You can go all the way to the very top here. But then I'll start to pull out even something smaller. What happens if instead of BBs, we start to use sand? So now there's even more space in between particles and in between the molecules. So we can now very finely start to fill in all of the gaps in between those BBs in between those marbles, in between the ping pong balls, we now have very fine particles that can actually fit in the spaces that I've left before. Even if it doesn't look like anything else can fill, if we think about smaller particles, and there's very, very often always a smaller particle that you can find, you can very easily start to fill in those gaps between the spaces. And at this point, again, I'll pull my students and ask, you know, is the beaker full? Give me a thumbs up if it's full. Give me a thumbs down if you think something else can still fit in there. And at this point, sort of squeezed out one of my 
ping pong balls. But at this point, almost all of them are going to say, yeah, it's full. You can't get, you know, sand is really finely divided. You might get a couple of kids that say something else can still fit. But at this point, they'll say, yeah, that's completely full. And so at that point, they're like, yeah, that's it. I mean, you can't get, you know, they can see, they can't even see gaps anymore. And so they assume that's completely full. And then I'll pull out this. What happens if we add water to this? So if you start to pour water over top of the sand, they can see that the water will even start to go down into the sand and seep in. Sometimes you might even get a little bit of air bubbles that are starting to, to form on the inside. But you can actually watch the water starting to percolate down through the sand grains. So even in between those very fine sand grains, you still have more space that can be filled in. And you can fill this all the way to the top. I usually stop at this point because this can become a bit of a pain to clean up. Uh, if you have wet sand inside of a beaker with a bunch of other stuff, you now have to get all this stuff apart at some point in time. Uh, what I usually do is go, I go to the hardware store, get a big screen, pour all the stuff through the screen so the BBs will get caught, the marbles will get caught, the, some of the sand does get caught, and the ping pong balls you can pick off very easily. After that, though, I let the sand dry. I usually do this at the beginning of the school year, usually around September when we're talking about mixtures and classifying things as atoms or molecules. So it's usually still fairly warm outside. I just let it sit out in the sun for a day, and then the sand is dry, and then I can repackage everything and pull the BBs through a, fine, a thicker mesh screen, and then the BBs get caught, the sand falls through, and then you can throw everything on the shelf and use it again next year. Uh, I do this for three classes, though, so I do have enough to do this three times. This is not something you can reset in between class periods and hope that it's going to go well the second time. It does have to be dry sand. It does have to be everything separated to start with. But it's a really dramatic way to get my kids to start to visualize very early on in the school year that what we're talking about is just a whole bunch of particles. I know that when I see chemistry, I see a bunch of little spheres colliding together and making reactions and making new molecules. And I know that when my students walk into my classroom, that's not how they view the world at all. And so my job over the course of the year is to make it as visually possible for them just to see chemistry as a bunch of atoms colliding together all the time and making all of the stuff that we see on the macroscopic level. This is a really good way at the beginning of the year and a very easy to see way what's actually happening with these molecules. You can then extract this into something that's a little bit more chemistry. I have here just a regular glass tube. And I have some regular water here. And I have some methanol. And I'm going to put just a little bit of food dye in the water just to make it easier to see. This isn't really a necessary step, but it is kind of handy for one of the teaching points. So just a little bit of red food coloring. And I'm going to pour in the water into this tube. Now the stand isn't really necessary. It's just so that I didn't have to try to hold it the whole time. And I start just by pouring the tube about half filled with water. I eyeball it as much as I can. I usually have the students tell me when it's halfway, because then I don't have to worry about looking at two things at one time. But we're about halfway there. Everyone agree? OK. So we're about halfway there. And then you'll very carefully take the methanol. Um, methanol isn't required for this. You can do this with ethanol. The important thing is that the alcohol is very dry, very anhydrous, in order for this to work. Uh, if it's a 95% or a 70%, it will work. But the drier you can get the alcohol, the better this demonstration is. So then I just layer the methanol on top. And I pour this very carefully down the side, because I do want to show the students the difference in density. Because at this point of the year, we've just talked about density. So it's really neat for them to see another application. Some of the color, food color will actually migrate into the methanol. But the students can still see a fairly clear gradation. So they can see rather clearly that there is a lot of red down here, a very thin amount here. And if they look at the interface, and if you pour a little bit more carefully or through a funnel, you'll see a very clear line where the two go. And so you can talk about the fact that methanol is less dense than water, and so it's going to layer on top. But the two will mix together. Both of them have an OH group. And then I cap it at this point. Uh, one important thing, if you do get a rubber stopper that fits your glass tube that you use for this, poke a hole into your rubber stopper. 
If you know anything about Boyle's Law, when you push down on this to cap it, you've just built up a whole lot of pressure. So when you push down here and you lift the tube up, very often you just push the stopper off the bottom of your tube. So it becomes a rather big mess to clean up, I know from experience. So a small hole at the very top, uh, and it just make it small enough a very thin pin hole will be fine. Enough that air can escape, but water's not going to come leaking out or methanol's not going to come leaking out. And stopper early well. And at this point, I'll walk around or I'll pick one of the students to come up and mark a line on this. My students, I've trained to not trust me at times, um, and I want to make sure that they don't think that there's any trick up my sleeve or that I'm doing any magic trick or something like that. So I'll usually have a student come up and mark the line on the, on the tube where the liquid level is when we begin. And then all I do is invert. And they can actually see as the bubble drops in between the layers. They start to mix together. Most of the red food coloring is still with the water at this point, so we're not getting complete mixing. But one of the neat things is if you look at the top, you can actually see bubbling happening. Well, obviously bubbles are a sign of a chemical reaction, right? But this isn't a chemical reaction. We're just dissolving methanol into water. So what would those bubbles possibly be? So I keep going back and forth, and I'll usually take this back and let every kid in the class see it because it's a little bit small to see. So I'll walk around the classroom, give them a chance to look at the bubbles that are formed and see that there's bubbles inside of this tube. And by the time I've gotten all the way through the classroom, usually a significant difference has happened. So if I take this back to the original position where I was before, if you look at where my black line was when I began, the liquid level is suddenly a lot lower than it was when we started. Well, why would the liquid level decrease? And this blows my students' minds. Because they think when you add two volumes together, the volume must be constant, the law of conservation of volume. And it allows me a very valuable time to discuss that there is no conservation of volume because of what we just saw with the previous demonstration. Sometimes molecules can fit in between other molecules. So one of the graphical aids that I came up with to help display this, if you just want to make cutouts, I often draw this on the board because my students can't see overhead. Uh, but if we look at the cutouts here, and a few stray BBs, if we look at the cutouts here, we have just methanol molecules if you had pure methanol. And hydrogen bonding can happen between oxygen and hydrogen, especially ones that are bonded to another hydrogen. You've got a slightly negative oxygen, a slightly positive hydrogen, and then the hydrogen bonding can happen between the two of those. And likewise over here and over here. Well, you also have this side of methanol, though, that's not really capable of hydrogen bonding. Carbon to hydrogen bonds have a very small electronegativity difference. They're not highly polar. So these parts can really only do van der Waals bonding. They can't really do hydrogen bonding like the oxygen to hydrogens can. Well, if you take a really small molecule like water and you start with your 50 milliliters of water and add it in, if the water can actually squeeze its way in between molecules because of the very strong hydrogen bonding that can happen between these oxygens and hydrogens, we've now provided a liquid that can go in between the molecules of the liquid that's already there. So you see a volume reduction due to the very strong hydrogen bonding that pulls these methanol and these oxygen molecules, or methanol and water molecules together between the oxygen and hydrogens that are doing the hydrogen bonding. So you actually see a shrinking of volume inside of the tube here because the molecules have strong intermolecular forces that actually pull them together and reduce the effective volume that they take. It was a really powerful demonstration that allowed my students to confront some of their misconceptions and also allows me to give them a very visual way to start looking at the chemistry they're going to see all year. I would recommend this demonstration if you get a chance to do it. It's a really great way to open some wonderful discussions with your students. Thank you.